The Constitution says that we have the right to consume cannabis. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. Welcome, welcome, friends, family, canapreneurs. This is Brainstorm once again, bringing you your weekly broadcast podcast high up in Denver, Colorado, exploring the business side of this newly emerging economy while living the lifestyle. Hey, canapreneurs, this week's show is sponsored by Dairy Berry's Recording Studio. Dairy Berry's Recording Studio, located in Arvada, Colorado, is your local recording studio with affordable rates. Mark is well experienced and will make your show, music, or any audio you have sound great. He makes our show come across the internet loud and clear every week, and he can do the same for your project. Take a look at DairyBerry'sRecordingStudio.com or call Mark at 303-456-8216. We're back and thank you for joining us for another great show of the Cannabis Community Project official podcast, The Grind and Burn. Broadcasting once again from Dank Studios up here at 3835 Elm Street, just off of Park Hill in Denver, North Denver, Colorado. Come and visit us. There's a lot going on here. This is home sweet home for me. I am staring out a giant window on a beautiful sunny afternoon watching probably 50 people in just the last 20 or so minutes I've been here come to the door and leave with smiles on their face and that's what I hope you get from this show is that you come in and you leave with a smile (laughs) imagine having not just this show but all things cannabis related where we could really indulge in the world of cannabis where we could find out what's going on out there beyond a basic networking event or beyond just a basic come and smoke event. We need a place, right? And it can't really be a co-working space because that, that model just doesn't quite fit for what's lacking in the market. We need a space where people could think about having cannabis weddings, think about having cannabis birthday parties, think about hanging out on a Friday or Saturday night in a full-size warehouse with a semi-private outdoor patio to consume, tucked away in an industrial area of town next to one of the top five premier dispensaries in town, and now it's happening. I don't want to give away any details or any confidentiality. I just want you to get ready to really have access to some place where people can truly smoke around town. Because if you've been seeing the articles, you've been seeing the news that's been coming out, cops slowly, one by one, raiding all the places around town. They're allowing consumption to take place, even in private clubs, doing these passive raids of shutting down events and activities and group meetups. Well, we can put a stop to this. And a lot of it comes within the environment, right? Where, where, are we actually having these events and what's going on and what type of laws are we in compliant with? But there's such a need out there because we got to get together. We have to form together as a community. That's the only way we can grow and that's the only way we can find out about one another. I mean, just being on Facebook or Mass Roots or any other social media is a start, but you actually have to go out and meet people face to face. So that's what we're trying to bring you here at the Cannabis Community Project. I just wanted to give you a little bit of what's going on, kind of what the bigger vision is of what we're looking at. Maybe this warehouse might also stir, s- serve as a bigger media studio where we can start producing short films and developing TV shows and of course more podcasting all streamed online where the true power of it all is on the internet. All these things I was thinking about this week as I was talking to this week's guest, the director of the documentary film, Rolling Papers. I sat down with Mitch Dickman, who gave me the behind the scenes on what it really takes to put a documentary together and some of the things that you're going to see in this documentary that you can now go and find online. Go to the websites where you can download 
This is a good one. I watched it twice. I had a great conversation with them. It really made me think. It was it was a good look back in time to the 2012, 2013 era, which feels like a long time ago, but it actually wasn't, right? It wasn't that long ago. And now here we are in a whole new stage, a whole new era to move forward. And this documentary is one of those pieces in time that we shouldn't forget. When the Denver Post took a national stance as a major newspaper and hired a editor or a reporter I guess, the journalist, to specifically focus on cannabis issues. The pot reporter, Richard or Ricardo Baca, who runs the Cannabis, a very informational website, a lot going on there. I would love to have him on this podcast. So if anybody knows him, reach out to him. I'm going to try to send him an email. I'd like to really talk to him about the last three, four years of how things have transpired, especially now that I've seen this documentary. I kind of feel like I have a little bit of insight to him and where he got started. And now that it's been a few years, he might have some great insight into where we're going and what he's seen and and reported on over the years. So we got a lot going on. Great interview this week. Let's jump right in. But like always, before we get there, let's make sure to remember what we learned last week with our short-term memory flashback. (laughs) Do you remember what we talked about? you remember who it was with? This is why we do it. If you're like me, your memory may not be the best nowadays. And it's not because you're smoking marijuana. That is a fact. It's just because you're not focusing and prioritizing your mental images and text into a coding that indexes into your brain. (laughs) Grindenberg. Okay, so, um, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> Formerly, my, my firm is David B. Bush, LLC. You are a premier hemp attorney. Is that how you classify yourself? Well, that is primarily what I'm doing is industrial hemp law. Uh, there's a handful of us in Colorado, and frankly, most of the other people who practice industrial hemp law are uh, really more marijuana attorneys than they are uh, industrial hemp attorneys, but they just have clients in the industrial hemp space. We jump south to Pueblo because of some things that are very interesting happening in the southern part of the state with the hemp industry, and it seemed like our next logical step to take was to go there. I, I definitely think I feel vested in this industry because this is what I'm trying to make a living off of yeah. as the hemp guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so the more people succeed, and this is what I tell people all the time, is, is my life's work is to help you succeed. And if you succeed, then I will succeed too. Well, maybe in a year you'll come back and you'll have something else that uh, that I could help you with as a lawyer. So giving advice to people, it's not just legal advice, it's all kinds of advice, and sometimes it's legal unless someone has a reason to try to produce marijuana seed in a breeding operation, you're really not going to see male marijuana plants. Oh, yeah. It's just the area of a circle, pi r squared, 75 square miles, where because they chose that particular location to grow marijuana, they have ruled out anybody from growing a industrial hemp within that radius. But well, this is a, a good example of why we need a premier lawyer, right? Of why everybody needs a lawyer. Uh, absolutely. And I can suggest a couple things in that regard. For those of you who are interested in learning more about industrial hemp and becoming involved, there is a huge event. It's the biggest one of the year in the state of Colorado, and we're the biggest hemp state, and that is the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo. It's going to be held on Friday and Saturday, April 1st and 2nd, at the Ranch Events Complex in Loveland. What's the first thing they should do, or one of the first things? First thing is nobody, nobody should be ashamed to start in the basement. And that is what I see over and over again, is people think the only way they can start a business is to find that magic investor, the rich Uncle George out there somewhere, who will give them $43 million for them to build their empire. And I'm going to include you in that. I've seen how you have been very frugal and how you've been very flexible and very creative and very entrepreneurial and you have a very nice broadcasting company. People should not be ashamed to start in their garage, start in their basement. Think of Steve Jobs. Think of all those people who have made incredible contributions to the American economy and to our consumer economy and started from nowhere. You can too. I appreciate that. How long have you been listening to the show? Long enough to know that it's your show, and all you got to do to be on it 
is just reach out to us at CannabisCommunityProject.com or email brainstorm at CannabisCommunityProject.com. Hey, Cannapreneurs, let me take a second just to tell you about some friends of mine as well as close sponsors of the show. Cushly Organic Products. The makers of Cushly have been environmental odor control consultants for more than 30 years. Their company puts out products that are used in hospitals, healthcare facilities, clinics, and homes throughout the United States and beyond. Cushly began as a product to help people who were going through chemotherapy and other patients who were in legal states but still not wanting to deal with the odor that medical marijuana brings when it is smoked. So Cushly has invented this very unique product that works like none other. I use it myself and many of my close friends and family use it. What it does is it eliminates odor. It doesn't mask it. It's not a perfume. It's not a cologne. It eliminates it. And it's organic and it's non-toxic. Please check them out. They're good friends of the show and there's a reason for that. It's because I only keep the best around my team. And Cushly is one of the best. www.cushly.com Also find them on Facebook and other social media under the same name. Cushly Organic Products. Feeling guilty about a time with cannabis? Get it off your chest and confess it on Canafessions, your public forum to absolve your soul. New voice message, Wednesday, 4.21 p.m. Oh, uh, yeah, I'd like to make a confession. My name is Walter. I have to confess that I went to Carlsbad Caverns and we went down in the cavern, kind of got separated from our group a little bit. A friend and I uh, were just standing there watching the cave and we decided to uh, light one up there in the, in the middle of Carlsbad Cave and I kind of feel bad about that, but I'm glad I did it. So thanks for letting me confess. To replay this message, press 1. To delete this message and go to the next, press 7. To save. You have no more messages. And that was Canafessions. If you have a confession to make, contact me via Facebook or the website at CannabisCommunityProject.com. We get the show via the podcast app through iTunes, and we listen to it on our phones mostly um, in the garden. We listen to the show... As soon as it comes out, like it, that little red dot pops up on Saturdays usually. We usually listen to the show on Saturday. If we can't, we'll listen to it on Sunday. You know, as soon as we can, the next time we're gardening, we listen to it. And it's almost like you're hanging out in the garden with us, getting that uh, getting that plant therapy that we were talking about earlier. So you don't even know it, and you're getting it from the other side of the country, which is pretty neat. And, uh, and you're giving our plants therapy, too. They know your voice. They're talking to you. Same as the, all the other podcasts that we listen to in the garden. All of our plants are familiar with everybody's voices. It's like they have their own little community of, of friends and family that they visit with. Um, sometimes we listen to it in the car, you know, like if we don't have uh, the opportunity to listen to it in the garden. But mostly it's, it's gardening time for the Cannabis Community Project. Complete this sentence. I wish I had someone with whom I could share... <laughs> How about, I, I wish I had someone I could share more weed with. <laughs> <laughs> like more smoking partners? Yeah, I, I wish I had more people that were open to the thought of cannabis being a drug and instead being a right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Welcome to a dream in a doubt. Who else? Nowhere. Y'all thought, see, Pounds out, sorry. Now we done put in. Let's go. There's a widow in the hood, nigga. Where? Where? Young YF looking nine feet tall. Go. Mm hmm. Gonna be a young king when Tech Nine's gone. Still, I'm only human. Local rappers don't stand close. My spirit stay human. Heard I had it for counter just to get a point across. That's how you really rap. Fatty had down syndrome. Give me that merch back. Right back up nine bucks plus tax. Done taking shots. Nobody bust back. Where it is in Winnie's. We ain't taking orders. Bodyguards and soldiers by my woman. Let's go. Real talk to the 
Cause I'm looking from the top And I'm looking like a goddess And my man is a god And I'm laughing at these bones Cause they all up on this job And I chuckle pretty hard Cause they funny like a drug No, no, H2O, blood overload Wiping out my hoes With a flow, real overdose Blooming like a rose How I grow, weird, all I know Never gonna go loyal So feel it in my soul Get my when you're stealing guts With my name all in your mouth I feel the blessed. widow in the hood, nigga Weird, weird They got it so weird there's a god over weird golf. There's a goddess up in here. Just golf. Let's go. Have you done any other podcasts or anything? Or? Yeah, we've done a few podcasts. Yeah. Are you sick of talking about your movie? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, how, how long has it been since the inception of it all? Um, It was like December 31st of 2013 really so yeah it came together pretty quickly two plus years yeah on this. so you've been talking about this film for quite a while yeah a little bit so my name is mitch dickman i'm the producer and director of rolling papers rolling papers uh documentary right yep i watched it last night and this is the documentary following the denver post and in, in the ricardo vaca very specifically that was one of the questions i wanted to ask you if that was the targeted theme of it beforehand or if that's kind of what developed as it came about but it, it is pretty much about the 2012 transition legalization the denver post hiring on a porter and uh kind of working through mainstream media on on the cannabis industry is that a correct summation of... Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good summation. There's been a lot of films about marijuana, and some of our team members were making a film back in 2009, 2010, 2011 about medicinal marijuana and the and the challenge to get it legalized. That film got kind of put on the back burner for a couple reasons. One, if you're making a documentary and you're not an actual advocate and you're trying to look at an issue, it can become kind of challenging yeah. if the hyperbole is just on both sides and it's constantly swinging back and forth and it's not necessarily, you know, documentary should be entertaining. So I think that got kind of put on the back burner and Daniel Youngie and Allison Greenberg Millis went on to win the Academy Award for Saving Face while they put that on the back burner. And then it was in 2013 when Britta reached out to Ricardo when he got appointed the position of marijuana editor that they thought about bringing the film back up when legal sales started. And that was the time I came on the project too. And I really wasn't interested in marijuana as an issue, nor was I interested in the debate because that happened. I mean, Colorado voters decided in 2012 that we wanted this substance illegal and you know why talk about the merits of that at that point so we really kind of just wanted to look at now what and we felt that the Denver Post was a good vehicle in which to tell that story I mean journalists are the ones that are framing the conversation and um, it also provided a nice Platform. sub story yeah. yeah and it got a lot of national attention I'm so are you from a filmmaking background yeah and you spent the last years making documentaries mm -hmm. or other types of films yeah I mean I've done kind of done everything I went to film school for it so see you Denver yeah and so are you a native color no no. I'm from Missouri. But you live here now? Yep. Okay. But yeah, I mean, theater, commercials, narrative films, documentaries, kind of done a little bit of it all. So when you were, were you presented with this as a theme for the movie or was it something that you weren't interested in, but then on your own kind of went, well, this might no, actually be something. No, no, no. Like these producers that I was fortunate to work with. Do you want to give their names? Yeah. Britta Erickson, Carl Kister, Allison Greenberg Millis, Katie Shapiro, and Daniel Youngie. So, I mean, just having that many, it's not cooks in the kitchen, it's more collaborative. Collaborators. Um, so it was kind of Britta's thought at first to explore Ricardo as a subject, and that was really interesting. And another main collaborator of mine, Zach Armstrong, and I were like, well, we'll give it a try. So we, we really kind of just tipped our toe in the water January 1st. Sometimes you start a film with a ton of pre-production, and you know what the story is, and you kind of go out and try to figure out how to capture that. This was the opposite. This was no pre-production whatsoever, and just kind of fly on the wall, see what happens. Can I ask about that? When you say a lot of pre-production of film, are we talking in general or for documentaries or? feature films whoa. I mean maybe I'm saying that because I come from like a line producing assistant directing background where uh -huh. most of the work is done in prep you have a schedule you know what the script is you know what those things are You're, even certain documentary films you package it and you get all the the key elements attached and you know who your interview subjects are going to be and you go out and you raise the money for that and so you kind of have a have to have a better idea as to what you're doing yeah. this was a really kind of fly by the seat of our pants type film which worked well because there's no way you could have prepped this project. <laughs> I've always wondered about documentaries in that light because documentaries, you, you kind of follow people, right? And for a far extended 
time than what a normal movie would be made in. So you're kind of following somebody and are you looking for a story or do you have kind of a story in mind beforehand and then kind of pick it out as you see what's going on over the months as it develops? How does that process work? I'm very curious. I mean, it depends. So I'll give you three examples. The last film I did, uh, I directed was called Hannah Ranch. Mm -hmm. Um, And I knew what the story was before we even started shooting. It was a tragic story about a man who committed suicide in south of Colorado Springs who was a rancher, was kind of at the forefront of the environmental eco-rancher, you know, food movement. It was a matter of contacting all the family and figuring out these long interviews to piece the story together that had already happened. Being Evil, about Evil Knievel, which Daniel directed and Johnny Knoxville produced, they spent two years shopping that film around. I mean, Evil Knievel had already died. They knew what his story was, but it was figuring out the key elements to get the financing in place to be able to do the film. And then there's projects like these where you get a little bit of development money and you go out and you're like, let's see if something's there. Let's see if it's worth it to spend the time and energy it takes to do a project. And I've looked. Nobody else has really taken this angle on making a movie about either the Denver Post or Cardo Baca or anything else. Are you kind of the only one who's... Yeah, for sure. Okay, because I've seen on Netflix, but there's a few other kind of from the 2012 transition in Colorado uh, documentaries that were made, and they focus on different aspects. But this was the first one that was specifically kind of on this, which was kind of the big story that came about. How did the relationship with the Denver Post and this start? Did you approach them and mm-hmm. say, hey, we're thinking about doing this? And they opened arms, said, come on in? Or yeah. how did that happen? They said, hell no. No, um, <laughs> Britta Erickson, again, um, she'd done a film called Convention in 2008 around the Democratic National Convention. And one of her characters slash storylines was someone within the Denver Post. So the editor, Greg Moore, was comfortable with Britta and they'd already had a history there. So she pitched it as an idea um, to them and they were comfortable with it. And we had very clear boundaries that this wasn't branded content. We could be critical of the Denver Post if we felt we needed to be. Um, they had no editorial control or no financial stake in what happened. It's they came of, out looking pretty decent. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just kind of reflective of it and like <laughs> very forward thinking for, for a newspaper today to be devoting this kind of attention to it. Greg Moore, the editor, mm-hmm. he's uh, he was he was funny. And yeah. He looks like a great guy to come oh, he's awesome. ahead of it. As a matter of fact, I wrote down one of the quotes that made me laugh out loud in the movie was when he said they're looking at the decision to hire Rick Baca. He had previously been in the music scene, so he knew he was familiar with marijuana. Yeah, that's good to that good made luck. me just laugh. Yeah, that's good. It, it, was, it was funny, and he seemed like a, a really good guy throughout this. When they sent him to Uruguay and you guys tagged along, how did that work? Did you just fund your own budget, mm-hmm. and because he was going, that was just part of what you got to do, and you just went with him? Yeah, I mean, he, he went on the post to be able to uh, to pull the trip off and cover the story, and we figured out the resources within our budget to make it happen. Did and he go alone? As, yeah. Okay, and then how many of your crew went? We had two, just my, myself and my main collaborator, Zach Armstrong, and then um, we hired a production services company out of Uruguay. So we had a translator, we had a driver, we had a sound recording uh, person, and we had a producer. Kind of drove us all around. And what was that like, roaming the streets of Uruguay awesome. with the cameras? And totally and, like gonzo journalism. It was great. <laughs> People very interested, a little standoffish. Um, you know, Ricardo had prepped it really well and yeah. like reached out to a lot of people before. And then obviously, you know, he was trying to get the interview with the president and all the way up until the end. Um, no, I mean, Uruguay is a beautiful country, very nice people. Chivitos are delicious. And um, yeah, it was great. That's the sandwich torta looking yeah. thing. That was actually very interesting because prior to seeing that that segment in your movie, I had a different perception of what was going on down there. In my mind, it was kind of an extension of what was happening here in Colorado. And I think what your movie highlighted was not really what's going on down there. There's some similar goals in legalization, but the I guess the, the purpose behind it is very different and their belief around marijuana in general is a little different and how they want to implement it is very different so that was very educational cool a little enlightening to realize that you know colorado is still unique in what they're doing here despite what everybody else in the world is doing sure that was, that was a good highlight on that how much money does it actually take to fund a film like this three dollars three dollars bucket of chicken yeah no. <laughs> uh no we can't disclose the budget yeah, yeah that's fine Sorry. i mean are we are we talking about you know large budgets comparable to maybe yeah it's in the six it's under a million okay and did you crowdfund this we did do some crowdfunding crowdfunding uh was a portion of the budget i mean and really you get funding at kind of all levels so again i mentioned i mentioned that initial development money from the producer 
years, we had a fiscal sponsor in the Denver Film Society. So anybody that wanted to make a donation could channel it through them, and then they would help us on the project. The Kickstarter was huge um, just to show supporters and that people believed in the project. And then it also kind of it raises the attention of the industry. So we got some cold calls from like Sony Pictures Classics and the Weinstein Company and some sales agents and things like that. IndieWire, it put them on their radar. And then private equity. So we went to individual investors and sat down and pitched them the film and you know why we thought it would make a buck. Probably the most interesting one was the Arcview Cannabis uh-huh. Network. Are oh, you yeah. familiar with them? Oh, yeah. So yeah, we pitched with them, their group. And uh, I just remember being on like the Skype podcast and going against a weed yo-yo and like a bu- some kind of a growing bucket. And then here we are just like a, a film, but we were right in the mix there. And yeah. then we went to their thing and we got a lot of money out of Arcview and, and yeah. those investors are happy. So we're... Arcview, the big national one locally here in Boulder, we have Canopy, which oh, okay. is the extension of Arcview, doing the same thing just on a local level. Every cool. semester they have 10 companies that come through, they fund them $20,000 each in exchange for 9.5% of their business. And then they have three, four <coughs> months to basically work together as a collaborative team, very similar to Arcview. And then they make bigger and bigger pitches through the Arcview uh, network as, cool. as they get going. So what it sounds like is you're saying is a movie is very similar to a business or a mm-hmm. product. You, you got to get some people to see yeah. fund you. Yep. And then you got to make a little bit and then you got to get more people to fund you a little yeah. bit more. And then you got to do a little bit more and get more people to fund you until yeah. it finally gets out to a point of distribution which is where you're at now. Totally. No matter how many times I thought like, oh, I'm just an artist, you know, and I'm making a film. It's like, no, I got, I'm kind of like Rye. I've got a baby to feed, you know, and she can't eat movies. So, um, got to figure out a way to like make this a business. Is this your full-time gig? Are mm-hmm. you a director, producer? Yep. Is it, is it- full-time thing. Yeah. So this means you live off of commission, I guess, in a sense. Uh, or salary, whatever you want. Not, not necessarily commission, but like a fight for a, a day rate or a monthly wage. From those who are investing in you? Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Or in the project. Like each project has its own budget. Same way I'd pay a DP, you know, a certain amount per day, I'll put a salary in for myself. As the director on mm-hmm. that. Okay. And then does it also where if the movie becomes hugely successful and, and profitable, you share in that also? Sure. So then the payoff is really not necessarily day-to-day expense of what the salary is. It's really trying to get the big payoff. and then. No, I mean, no. It, it, it is the day-to-day. Like yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, to make a sustainable filmmaking industry, we all have to like... You know, you can't bank on Blair Witch, you know, like <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard people, you know, pitch projects and they think they're going to be that one. And that just doesn't happen. And I mean, even Rolling Papers did well by all accounts selling out of South by and, and it's got a pretty good distribution plan. But, you know, what, there's no guarantee to see any kind of back end. And even Blair Witch wasn't wholly organic totally. in, in that sense. There yeah. was a lot of infrastructure support from media and other things that made that whole thing happen. And I mean, I'm planning on this this podcast being whether we make Make it or break it on this film so 10,000 downloads tonight no pressure uh, are you officially on sales because I yeah. got the screener so I yep. wasn't sure when the exact yeah we released um, on February 19th we were okay. in 22 cities and then on demand in 13 countries so to get in a theater are we talking about normal theaters like AMC Century or smart house or like local? we didn't do landmark but it's okay. all art house theater so in Denver it's a C film center and Seattle it's the Sundance Select in okay. Los Angeles. It's a Lemley. How does that work? You send them a screener and an invitation saying, please watch. And if you like, can I be in your theater? No. Or? So we sold to a company called Alchemy in March of last year. And so they handle that. They had a staff of about 100 people. And one of them is a theatrical booker. So they contact each theater and say, here's a film, here's a poster, and pretty much take it from there. And is it a buy the space type thing? You buy the theater for a night and then they... It's a revenue split. Okay. Interesting. Because uh, I'm sure there's people thinking about making documentaries. Don't, don't. have... Don't? That's your no, advice? Just, no, go for it. Yeah, uh, no. Do you feel emotionally drained and... and no, 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 I enjoy it a lot. Or is it a competition thing? <laughs> no, no, no. The more the merrier. I mean, I, I've talked to people who always want to do some type of media, whether it's videos or radio or, or films or, or something else, but they don't have investors and they don't have really a plan or, or anywhere to go and they're not really sure how to do it. So I'm always curious, to what does it actually take to get something out there in the world and, and get it out there? Aside from the theaters, is there an online... Oh, yeah. iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Prime... Time Warner, Comcast. And that's really where docs live right now mm-hmm. is in the what they call the video on demand space. So, And this is just transactional internet video on demand. 
Um, so it comes out on Netflix in May, but don't wait till May. Go buy it now. Straight from the website or from from Amazon. iTunes. Those are kind of okay. places. Yeah, you can just search it. Yeah, that's kind of the future, anyways, right? Media. The the actual physical location is probably going to be rarer and rarer sure. as, as things go on. What was prior to this your involvement with the industry? With the cannabis industry? Yeah. No involvement. I've been a, a consumer of cannabis, not anything crazy, but you know, it's always been a private thing in in my home. So after this, do you feel a different sense of connection? or, or sure. responsibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the industry. Yeah. Like it's kind of, when you do a documentary film, I mean, you get into these cultures or subcultures, it's kind of like a wormhole, you know, you, you go in and then all of a sudden it opens up into the spider web of so many other interesting things. I had no idea about dabs or shatter or cannabis <laughs> cup or like any of those type of things and, and realize how smart and talented a lot of these people are and how passionate they are about the plant. And, you know, I know there's been people screaming for a long time that this is safer than alcohol and this should be the way that we're heading and not that I didn't necessarily pay attention to it, but it's just it wasn't one of the issues that no. was high on my my list, and it's still not. But um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for this kind of entrepreneurial nature of this industry. Would you do any other films or follow up films? No, no, moving on to something no. else. Is that because of? maybe a lack of profitability or just the issues have been touched on the stories have been told that kind of um i mean i guess a little bit of all of it yeah i just i like to do move on to different things you know yeah what's next you said you're already in the middle of another making of a film what are you working on? we're in the, wrapping up production on a film out of australia called casting jean benet does this have anything to do with the Katy perry no. Really jean benet? No. No. Okay. No. yeah and then we're developing a tv series called hoods in the woods doing two films this summer. One's a Bigfoot movie called Hoax, and then one's a kind of expressionistic take on Henry David Thoreau's Walden. So kind of got to have a lot of irons in the fire and see what happens. Is at all a Blair Witch Project and recreation? No, I mean, not Blair Witch. I mean, there are some parallels, but it'll be kind of more, the director's name's Matt Allen. It's more a throwback to like classic 70s, 80s, or John Carpenter, that kind of stuff. So when you're going from film to film, is it a complete, a project first before starting? Oh God, no. How do you physically manage multiple projects at the same time. I mean, you just have them at different stages. And we wrapped Rolling Papers in January of 2013. We've been screening, and that's a different kind of beast than being in production. You know, like yesterday, you know, we're shooting on a sound stage with a crew of 40 and a cast of 20. And then, you know, I'm developing stuff, so pitching stuff and raising money for projects. So you kind of get them at all three phases, development, production, and distribution. Is, does that happen with a team or as an individual out there constantly looking to build a team? Or you have kind of a set team where you go and find projects as a team and work together as a team? It's a little bit of both. I mean, my company is just myself, Listen Productions, but I tend to work with the same group of people and you move together from project to project. And uh, some of them you work together on, some of them you don't. I guess that's kind of the way I do it too. It's yeah. What's your deal, man? What's your backstory? Are you high? No. <laughs> that's funny. That was also funny in the movie. The question at the end to the editor, but also just a funny question in general. Um, mine started a couple years ago after my brother passed away from uh, leukemia hmm. and he was a I'm sorry he, to hear that uh, he was a grower in uh, northern California in the, what they call the Emerald Triangle at the time when he passed in 2009 the industry was a little different even though it was a medical existence the whole industry of treating medical issues with cannabis didn't really develop like it has today so when he passed just being exposed to what he was doing and what was going on and, and listening to I guess his passion and his life journey of what he was doing here of why he had both of his bedrooms in his house closed off and he slept in the kitchen because they were full of plants and like what would bring somebody to live this type of lifestyle and the more I, I kind of looked at it the more I realized that he wasn't just a stoner quote unquote stoner he was something a little bit beyond that and ironically he died surrounded by something that possibly could have helped him but the things of concentrates and oils and all that it, it just wasn't quite where it is today where it wasn't really known how to treat people with cancer with cannabis. You know, smoking alone is not a viable treatment by itself. So after he passed, I wanted to do something in memory of him. And the only thing I know how to really do is talk. I, I figured, well, why don't I start a podcast around the industry and explore his life by exploring other
other people's life in this industry. As I looked at other shows out there, what I found was a bunch of stoner shows, and I knew I wasn't going to fit in that crevice of life because it, it just wasn't me, it wasn't my vocabulary, it wasn't my personality. So I needed to do something that was more me, and, and my background is from marketing and business, so I, I saw a natural fit of just exploring business through the cannabis industry or exploring cannabis through through business. And, and that's where it started. So two years ago, I bought some cheap microphones. You know, before I had any of all this, it was just a couple microphones and didn't have a studio, didn't have anything. And just started calling businesses and saying, hey, can I come interview you and talk to you about what you do? And, and then I start talking to patients. And then I realized there's so much here. I just need to go with it and make it a real thing. Very cool. But now we have an industry where all of a sudden you can be somebody. You can have a job, you can get paid for it, and you can work your way up to be something more than whatever you're doing now, you know, working at Conoco or, you know, fast food or whatever you're doing. And that's kind of the point of view I wanted to take this show on. And that's what I've been hitting hard and trying to find the best of both worlds of talking about patient issues, which is very serious, but very different from talking about business issues. That, that's kind of where the creation of the other shows I, I got is just wanting to explore all the different avenues of the industry, but needing to have different different shows to do it. I, I don't have any plans of stopping. It's getting bigger and now I have a studio and now I'm attached with a dispensary. We're getting ready to launch a warehouse over here where we're going to have a full place for people to have meetings and, and do all sorts of other stuff. So it's growing and my goal is to really grow this into a media network, mostly based around podcasting, where I have a, a full lineup of shows under the cannabis umbrella. And whenever that gets to a point where I feel satisfied, then I'll look at doing shows outside of cannabis. There you go. <laughs> Take advantage of what you can. Yeah, until that point. So that, that's more or less what this is all about cool. and where this has come from. You know, want to talk to you about your movie. It's not so much, you know, about the marijuana aspects of the movie. The movie itself is very self-explanatory and anybody that watches it, I think will find it educational. And it's almost like a look back in time, a very short look back in time, but it feels like a long time ago. Sure. And that's what I was thinking as I was watching this was I was here when all this was happening, but it feels like such a long time ago where this movie is like giving me a little time machine to look back and go, yeah, I remember. I remember mm -hmm. when that was happening. We, we were there. Right. And not only that, but it's here in my hometown. I know where he's walking. I know the people and places he's talking about. So it felt very personal. Cool. And, and that's what I liked about it. And, uh, you know, I, I think Colorado has gotten a lot of attention. But to me, it's movies and media and this kind of stuff. It's just how I feel like I stay connected with what's going on. And about. honestly, I want to know about how you produce media because sure. that's what I'm interested in and I want to know how that relates to a business sense that other people who are artists as you said you know you're kind of a self-described artist somebody else is a self-described artist who wants to do something so hopefully they can hear something from you of how you actually became an independent entrepreneur in this industry how you stopped working for somebody else yeah. do, do you remember when that was when you working stopped for the man yeah when did you stop working for the man I mean, I, I, I've still freelanced for the man a lot, you know. Yeah. I, I, there was a time I did a lot of commercials, and I was definitely like ad agencies and clients and those type of things. That felt like working for the man. Did um, you ever do any non-media stuff? Did you ever? Yeah, you I, I poured concrete. Or, yeah, I, poured I waited. Concrete. I waited, okay. tab waited tables at Ruby Tuesday. I worked at a ski shop in Arvada, so and then I poured concrete for three years. That's the transition I want to know about. Is when did you go from doing just jobs in life to finding this career, this path that you're on? That I assume you're going to stick to, right? Yeah. That's kind of, this is your life now. When, when did that happen? How did that happen? That happened my like freshman and the sophomore year of college. So I worked all kinds of different jobs growing up. And then I was working concrete and like just a long ass hard day of work, which I love hard physical labor. There's a lot of times I'm I kind of like that one, that's a fallback or two. Like it just would be simple. Get up, bust your ass, take your hard hat and your lunch pail and go to work. Office um, space, right? Yeah. Yeah, just one day I was like, oh, I'm done with this. And I made up a bunch of resumes that basically said, you know, I didn't know anything, but I was new to it. Picked up the phone book, called every production company. I was living in Golden at the time, every production company in the phone book in uh, Western Denver metro area. And like all of them laughed at me except for one. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing a movie up in Nestas Park. I, you know, I won't pay you, but I'll feed you. And I was like, sweet, I'm there. And I uh, met my wife on the set of that movie. And that was 13 and a half years ago. Wow. So I've kind of been doing it ever since. There you go. So yeah. all you need sometimes is just an 
opportunity yep. and then to recognize it's an opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Many people might have said, no, right. you know, what do you mean? You're not going to pay me. Right. Or, That's so far away. I got to go to Estes Park. That's, yeah. how am I going to do that? Yeah. Well, what kind of parting advice could you give for somebody, whether it's marijuana industry or any industry, that you could just tell somebody, you want to do something different with your life? Here's what I think about life and here's how I did it. Oh, wow. I don't know that I'm in any place to offer up. But you're somewhere. That kind of advice. Yeah, for you're sure. Somewhere. I mean, I mean, you have I, I, mean movies, I, I do think I, credits, I, I, I do think it comes down to the process, focusing less on the actual product and focusing on the process in which it takes to make whatever it is that you're trying to do. The big part of that to me is other human beings. You know, film is a, a huge collaborative art form. You know, when all is said and done and you include the music, you know, we probably had a thousand people that worked on the film. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy to think, but there were a lot of people that contributed and treating those people with respect and with mindfulness and yeah. Yeah, like you're going to work on to, an, you know, walk on to another project and your reputation is important. So I think trusting the process and, and focusing less on the product will help you in whatever you want to do. And I saw the credits at the end of the film, a lot of people involved. How many of them were paid to be there? When you go into a dispensary and you're filming, do you have to pay those people? No, no none okay. of the subjects were paid. None of the locations You just were have paid. to get their permission to Correct. show them. Yeah. So, so how I, is it determined who's a paid person and who's just somebody that's in the background of movie well i mean my theory around documentary films is that you shouldn't pay anybody because it's nonfiction. you know journalists don't pay people so if you get higher profile and you're doing speaking fees and things like that the people in front of the camera and we ask a lot of them i mean that's a good question we've asked a lot of these people ricardo um, was very gracious in how much we followed him and how many things he's had to do for the film and same thing with a lot of our other characters but people on screen generally in docs don't get paid but everybody behind the camera working um, from the interns well not interns but from the production assistants on up to the producers try to get paid a little so when he's in his house just kind of on his laptop is that you with the camera just sitting there no that's, that's my dp zach armstrong and is that what he's doing is he literally just Dude. hanging out for hours and hours yeah with the camera do you know how long it took us to figure out getting outside of the newsroom or like how much you can make you know somebody typing on a keyboard interesting i don't know yeah, it, took a, it took a lot <laughs> i don't know if that's yeah. literally like hold still for 10 seconds and let's get a shot or if no it's just hours of just sitting there There's a lot i mean you kind of got to wait for moments to happen you know is there interaction between the crew and the yeah. subject? Yeah, yeah. So you let them know that you're there, uh-huh. and then ideally you become a fly on the wall, and they, they forget that you're there, and they become more comfortable. They act more like themselves, both just in their day-to-day what we call observational stuff and interviews as well. Like when we're having interviews, you do a very good job. Like you and I are having eye contact. Uh-huh. We're not, I'm not staring at the microphone you know, while I'm talking to you because that <laughs> freaks me out and makes me nervous. No, it's, you're just having a conversation with someone. Yeah, and uh, definitely there was some people that I was really wondering how you got them involved, like the Dr. J's guy. Persistence. It's kind of like Gorski says in the beginning, which is I like to hunt. Every project has somebody that doesn't want to be involved and you want to be respectful to them and and respect that decision, but kind of make your case of why it's important that they're involved. And we needed Dr. J to be involved because we can't just take one side of the story, quote unquote. Yeah, Yeah, it was a big part of the storyline, but I mean, you still got to get his permission, right? Correct. And he he still had to invite you into his place and do the whole deal. Or he just ambushed him like Michael Moore. <laughs> no, I'm not that guy. No, he seemed like his own battle going on in that sure. one. And I don't even know if they're around today. So. Yeah, they are. Are they? Okay. Yeah. So I, and they tested better next time they did the follow-up. Well, he might have contributed then to making there you go. the whole system better here, yeah. and just uh, just like everything else. So is there anything about this movie you would like people to know about before they watch it, while they're watching it, or just something that you think is kind of an important piece of what, what you put out here into the world? I was about ready to like go defensive. You know, like, because I think that's we've had some interesting reviews. Um, I think a lot of people would make the film differently. And what type of reviews? Oh, just, you know, newspaper reviews and stuff like that. But I mean, I think it's a huge subject. You can't get everything in there. And some people take it too seriously. Um, I'm watching a documentary. I'm oh, like be, you left stuff out. Yeah. Or, or that, like, I'm going to be educated about something. And it's kind of you to say that that's the case. But like, man, we want people to have fun. And I think that there's a new school of documentaries that are happening right now. There's a lot of good work being done in the space where people are pushing the boundaries as far as what a documentary is and getting less away from the Michael Moore, Inconvenient Truth, um, waiting for Superman, you know, issue films and and making it entertainment because you know really we're competing with real housewives of orange county and (laughs) sports center and the amazing race and all those different things you've got to try to make it as entertaining as possible so i would sit back i would relax take a deep breath and just kind of try to enjoy it and it was entertaining cool i had some laughs and a lot of music i don't know how many clearances for music you must have gotten 
it seemed like every 30 seconds you had a different somebody up there. So did yeah. you have to pay for that, or was yeah. that also just a permission? No. Each one of those. Wow. Yeah. Bone Thugs and Harmony was not, not, <laughs> not cheap. Not cheap. Um, cool, man. Well, that was very interesting. Cool. And, Thank you very uh, much. I, I look forward to uh, your next feature. Is there a specific website that kind of updates what you're working on, what's coming uh, out? I'm, I'm so bad about that. I'm not on social media. No. My website hasn't been updated no in like two years. No social media. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's listenproductions.com, but it hasn't been updated in a while. So when the movies come out, they, they just come out and... Well, I mean, like, this is good, man. We have a, you know, we have a distributor and a publicist that tells me where to go and who to talk to and not what to say. I can still be me. Was that who me, I was talking to? The yeah. publicist? Yeah, Elena. Elena. Okay. Yeah. Is she also local here? No, they're in LA. So, Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not like that at all. Very cool. Cool. I appreciate your time. Thank you, man. And uh, thanks for coming down and, yeah. and feel free to patron the place if you'd cool. like and, and feel free to contact us with your next film. Sounds good, man. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks. There you have it, Canterpreneurs. That's all I have for you this week. But make sure to stay in touch with us. Stay with us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, Twitter, all the networks out there, even Mass Roots and YouTube. Make sure to follow us every week right here. Leave your comments. Give us your feedback. Be on the show. We want to see you every week. This is your community. So make sure to come back. We'll see you next week. Oh!